Celebration of the Death Dream by Three Kings. Introduction Before the ceremony begins, a short instruction session occurs between the candidate and the initiator. The initiator, or guide, instructs the candidate on the history and characters of the ritual and gives a brief prelude and synopsis of the rite, thus. Guide The names of the three kings are Cheops, Kephren, and Menkare, who commissioned the pyramids at Giza, Egypt, as immense personal tombs. According to exoteric schoolbook history, the story told within the Order of Death, however, is much more detailed. According to this source, the three High Kings commissioned their megalithic tombs following a shared prophetic dream. That dream is here reenacted to honor the funding contributors behind the first monumental building project since the flood destroyed Atlantis. In the ritual, the parts of the three guides will be portrayed by a single initiator. The first guide is Cheops, who passes by John the Apostle on entering the City of Heaven. The second guide is Kephren, who passes by the Archangel Aniel at the entrance to the courtyard of the Holy Temple. The third guide is Menkari, who passes by Metatron, God's highest angel, to go on from this ritual into either a pseudo-political state of lodge work, a quasi-religious church of parties within the state, or to remain at this zero degree. Instruction the candidate is then asked if they understand what is going to happen among the characters during the ceremony. Thus, duly prepared, the candidate is allowed to enter the shadowy recesses of the vault room. Unseen hands help the candidate to lie flat down, face up, on the floor in the middle of the pitch black vault. When the guide's voice is heard first, a spotlight above the candidate clicks on, shining down on them, and a bell tolls faintly from the direction of the candidate's head. Voice over. Guide 1. Teaching a class. This is the wedding of love and the will, because it is written in the book of the law that love is the law, love under will. Look into the Book of Life, and there you will see that the One Love rules us all. The Book of Love also describes this One Law, or Law of One. It is considered a universal truth. Instruction A spotlight strikes a replica of the Kabbalist's Tree of Life shape. The faint bell tolls a second time now. Voice over. Guide 1. From this are suspended the seven hermetic axioms of the Kabbalion by a withering stem from the Tree of Life, whose three trunks can join the roots of Shekinah in Malkuth below and the two branches of the eighth and the ninth above. This truth is Jakaida over Chia, Nam Tar over Nam, Father over Son, and just so, love under will. Instruction The spotlight on the Tree of Life and the one on the candidate both switch off simultaneously, 
leaving the room once more enshrouded by pitch darkness. At the same time, the bell tolls a third time. At the same time, the guide lifts the candidate abruptly up to their feet. Then, all of a sudden, all lights in the room click on at once, to reveal the candidate is standing at the top of a vast hill, looking out over a lush valley. In the valley, we see the Tree of Life shape. Behind the candidate is a large wall between turreted towers to guard a city behind it. Guide 1 Welcome, Aki. Arise and be welcome to life after death, for you have now entered Jamrock, the Jamdom of Jagad. Hear now the sound of the death toll. The church bell chimes for thee, O recently deceased. My name is Cheops. I will guide you now. Come with me to the ways leading out of this world, reality, universe, place, and time. Follow me. Instruction The guide takes the candidate arm in arm and turns them about to face the turreted walls fortifying the city within. As the two climb up the hill toward the towering, fortified walls, voices echo from within the city, behind its massive, impenetrable facade. The guide speaks over top of these voices. Voiceovers. Come away from your reveries. You are being called by dull care, recalled to life. It is time now. Come away from your meditations. You are called to study at the foot of God. Duty calls. Karma yoga. The work of union. The great work calls. Guide 1, overlapping the voiceovers. You must come again to the here and now, Aki. Return from the dream of the unconscious multiverse. It is only one moment before Bereshith, the beginning. We must hurry. The clock already chimes the zero hour. Instruction. The distant bell, now a little louder, chimes for a fourth time. Guide 1. Hear it tolling. Follow the sound through the clear light uphill. Ascend the ancient pathway of history, concealing the underground current of energy beneath. Climb to the top of the hill and pass the well of souls, font of consciousness. Instruction. The guide leads the candidate by a well topped with a fountain. They draw near a large gate in one wall between two turreted towers. They step up seven rainbow-colored stairs to the gate. Guide 1. You approach now the grand archway, an entrance to the city of heaven. One of the twelve gates around New Jerusalem, the city of God. You approach from Eden, city of the dead, northeast of New Jerusalem. You approach the gate of Naphtali that is called Benjamin from within. This is the east-northeast gate, and it is guarded by the apostle John. Instruction The guide has thus far walked the candidate arm in arm. Now, the guide steps down and stands one stair behind the candidate. Around the corner steps the actor portraying the part of John the Apostle. Guide 1 to John Dear John, I am Cheops, a king called to fellowship and labor amongst other kings. Let me in now, O dear John, the Apostle of Christ, son of our father, 
by this east-northeast gate of Naphtali, entering New Jerusalem. The bell has tolled four times already, and now it will toll a fifth to candidate. Go now, I, Cheops, can follow you no longer. Instruction The bell, now louder through the gateway, chimes a fifth time. At that same moment, John the Apostle grips the candidate's hands, their left crossing under to the candidate's right hand, their right crossing over to the candidate's left. In this strong grip, the Apostle lifts and twirls the candidate across the threshold. This grip is called the Grip of John the Apostle of Christ and called Nibiru. Guide 2 The same actor as Guide 1 Behold, Aki, I am your guide inside the New Jerusalem. My name is Kephren. Follow me now. Instruction The guide resumes walking arm in arm with the candidate. They wind their way through seemingly endless, labyrinthine city streets. Guide 2 You have entered the city of God, New Jerusalem, by the east-northeast gate of Naphtali, called now Benjamin, by the admittance of John, Apostle of Christ, the Prince of Heaven. You are approaching the church with seven sides now. We must hurry for already the bell tolls a sixth time. Instruction The bell, exceedingly loud now, tolls from just inside the church. Before the closed door to the outer courtyard of the temple stands a guard. Guide 2 To Guard Quickly, Ishkur the Anunnaki, Gnostic Archon Astaphios, in the name of Tubal Cain, I command you, Archangel Aniel, let me in. I am Kephren, the Prince King of King Cheops. I am sent to fellowship and labor on his behalf among other kings. Let me in now, Aniel. Hurry, for already the bell has chimed six times, and soon it will toll Sabbath hour in heaven and I will have arrived too late for the apocalypse. Let me in now. Let me enter the door of Sardis to the seven-sided church. Instruction The actor portraying Aniel then opens the door of Sardis. The light from inside is even brighter than the light of New Jerusalem. Guide 2 this is the light that shines from inside Zion, in the Ark, inside the Holy of Holies, within the inner temple, beyond the outer courtyard. You now stand before an entry onto the outer courtyard of the third spiritual temple, called the Seven-Sided Church, inside the heart of New Jerusalem, the City of God in Heaven. I, Kephren, cannot go on. You must go through the doorway alone. Instruction The candidate is ushered through the doorway. Inside the courtyard's seven walls, at the center, arises a dodecahedral stained glass dome. This is the inner temple containing Zion, whose light refracts prismatically through the stained glass dodecahedron. A very large crowd of angels of pure light and spirits appearing like people has amassed in the courtyard around the inner temple. Guide 3, played by the same actor as Guides 1 and 2, the original initiator, comes forward and presents the candidate with a robe colored white just then the bell tolls for the seventh time. Guide 3 
My name is Menkari. I was sent to you by my father Kephren, and by his father, Cheops. I have come to guide you within the outer courtyard of the New Jerusalem Third Temple. Follow me now, please. Instruction Guide 3 takes the candidate arm in arm as before, and together they move up to the front of the crowd. Before the eastern veil of the five-sided inner temple. Just then, the veil parts and outsteps the archangel Metatron. He is glowing a purple, ultraviolet hue, and wears a black robe. He is very young in appearance. Metatron. I speak the truth to all of you assembled here now. I bring the true word of God, King over the living and the dead. There has been a rebellion in heaven. I come to bring news. O oh, Zion, hear me, O oh, Zion. I have seen the fallen ones lowered, and I have heard their eternal lament. It began when Raziel, also called Raguel, the archangel sent to tempt Eve in paradise by the apple and Adam after the exile by giving him Kabbalah to cease his prayer for forgiveness from God. Called together the other twenty-two angels and hosts who guard the twelve gates of New Jerusalem, the seven-sided courtyard, and the four others, like Raziel, who keep watch around the inner temple. He called them by night in heaven as God had only just then descended to walk in the Garden of Paradise. Then, at the same time as God returned to heaven to exile man and to curse the serpent, Shemiaza, the name Azza, Uza, or Raziel, as Samuel the Blind, the fallen Yaldabaoth, child of Sophia, firstborn in heaven, Raziel descended with his treacherous confederate conspirators. Of the twenty-two, only six joined him. Now come closer, O lambs of Jah, and divine children. Hear me tell you about how our Lord God did send down Christ, the Son of all mankind, to descend to earth and there to catch and punish the fallen light bearer, now become an adversary to all God's good. Through the realm of the seven heavens Christ descended. Through the Ophanim permutations of Baal Shem he descended. Christ conquered all the rebel angels turned to demonic villainy who fought amongst and against their archangelic and loyal brethren of splendor and victory in one fell swoop. Then Christ lowered himself further still, past the twelve mobile aeons, and past the seven spheres, and clutched a hold of Samuel, the torturous serpent, on earth below. With Satan in hand, Christ descended into the very shards of the Cliffoth themselves, to rule over the wasteland of Tohu and Bohu was the devil sent by Christ, and to the realms of Sheol and Gehenna were all of his minions dispatched. Oh, the fallen Grigori have I beheld with my own eyes, and on their behalf did I myself pray for amnesty. Christ told of how Sabaoth, the soul of Saclus, the spirit of Yaldabaoth, did repent. God then promised Satan that once every millennium upon earth the devil shall be released from hell to tempt himself and all the saved into betraying their repentance. That time on earth is now. Those who arrived by the six bells chime are hereby called to labor. 
four lodges that practice the three degrees of Imhotep you shall convene, and a fifth open to the public. In your four lodges you shall appoint five officers to stations, and there will be three open seats in the public lodge. These five stations will be equivalent to five political parties. The combination of all five lodges, 23 total members, is to be called the Atlantean Senate. Those who arrived after the seventh toll are hereby called to fellowship. First, we must convene the five political parties equivalent to the five officers' stations in each lodge. These can initiate independently of the lodges and combine to form churches equivalent to lodges and monasteries equivalent to the Senate. From candidates and monasteries elected by the churches, the Senate will appoint a Pope. The Pope can then convene a standing court. Instruction The crowd begin to divide themselves into two groups. The one forming in the north all don blue vestments, those in the south red. Guide 3 because you have arrived just as the bell tolled seven, you may choose either group to go with. Those angels in blue shall stay here in the outer courtyard to minister in the seven-sided church. Those spirits in red shall enter the inner temple to work the lodges and convene the senate in heaven on earth. All of us will work together with no secrets left unshared by any that relate to the work of us all. Instruction This concludes the ritual of the dream. The eye of the vault door is then opened and the candidate is escorted out. In the antechamber of the vault, the initiator explains the ceremony again to the initiate and asks them if they fully understand guide. So you see that the lodges practice three degrees of initiation, corresponding to Eden, New Jerusalem, and the outer courtyard of the third temple, and that these rituals date back to the three ranks of stone masons of the great pyramids commissioned by the three kings, Cheops, Kephren, and Menkare. In the three rituals corresponding to these three degrees, a candidate learns the secrets of the priestcraft allegorically, following the punishments of Raziel's co-conspirators as the killers of Hiram, grand architect on the first temple of God on earth. Likewise, the five continents each has its own form of religion, Egypto-Sumerian, Mesoamerican, Indo-Asian, Middle Eastern European, and indigenous aboriginal, and these all teach the way to perfect the soul through a Masonic art. The secrets of each way are taught through the rituals of the other. The apocalypse is now, when Satan tempts mankind away from these matters to pursue a merely, venally satisfying existence. Therefore, do not be like a drone. Yours is now the one law of do what thou wilt. You may choose either path to pursue, or neither. You may choose to teach all this to others, or to only pursue it silently. You may even choose to ignore all these affairs, and live according to carnal needs alone. For, because of that dream, the three great pyramids were built as a testimony for us all before eternity. Thus all that is may enter heaven, for heaven is forgiving of all sin beyond even the limits of our imaginations. All enters heaven eventually by nature alone, but we may choose the goals that give cause to our existence. Now this choice is before you. 
Do you understand the roles of the two options involved? Do you wish to side with either, or neither, or both? If you do not understand, now all answers can be given to you. Ask anything, or choose, now. The choice is before you. The Grip of Nyarlathotep Instruction As in the first degrees ceremony, the candidate is first given the knowledge lecture accompanied by a brief introduction to the initiation ritual, delivered by their guide or first initiator, who subsequently does not participate in the rite proper. The introduction lecture explains the origin of the rite in prehistoric antiquity, introduces the characters of the rite, and gives a brief synopsis of what occurs in the rite. Following this, the guide asks the candidate if they have any questions, and then the guide leads the candidate into the vault. Guide you have chosen to pursue the mysteries of Imhotep to learn about Atlantean masonry. But are you prepared to restore it? This is a solemn truth you must prove yourself. To enter paradise all one must do is choose not to bring about the ends of mischief and chaos. If you do not follow the urge to destroy yourself and be resurrected in a more perfect world, you would not exist at all. But we exist to build up, not tear down. You must work to restore the Atlantean tradition of fair justice and democratic ideals to reality. You must go out and tell all your friends to tell all their friends the right way to achieve transcendence though this right way will be different for each of them. How then can we spread the word about the good work of restoring Atlantean masonry? If we perfect ourselves, those who come to us will already understand and want to know more naturally. That is the subject of this ritual. In order to build the pyramids, our order recounts. Imhotep recruited the black magician, Nyarlathotep. Nyarlathotep then raised up workers from the dead. In this way, you will learn how to activate your naturally negative-oriented chi, or quanta of karma, and make them switch on positively. Therefore, during this rite, you are asked to meditate upon the level plane by day and the completed pyramids by night. This is to remind you of the underworld, where tomorrow is perpetually being built. Instruction Once the candidate confirms their understanding of this, the guide escorts the candidate into the vault. The 2A degree ritual begins in the same position as the one degree ritual, with the candidate lying face up, flat down, in the middle of the floor of the pitch black vault. Voice over. Before the beginning there was nothing. A vast empty void there was not. Nor was there a deep shadowy abyss. Nor even a pitch black vaulted tomb. There was simply nothing, and that was all that existed. This was before time began. Nothingness filled all the highest heavens and flooded right up to the feet of God. It moved across his face. He breathed nothingness in. Had it been like water, he might have drowned. But water had not been created yet. Instead, it was nothingness. 
instruction. The lights in the vault begin to fade up slowly from the direction of the candidate's head, representing dawn. Voice over. Then God uttered the universe, or one sequence of letter vibrations. This word became the highest heavens, and God reached out his right and left arms through the heavens, leaving hosts of angels in their wake. He reached out into the nothingness below, and it became solid in his wake. From the nothingness, God shaped, formed, molded, and made our world paradise. The nothingness that God shaved, sculpted, carved, and cast away fell and became material reality. Instruction From the direction of the candidate's feet, a large, shadowy object is moving as if it is alive. It resembles a very large octopus, however, with an unidentifiable number of tentacles. Voice over. We are told that when God first formed man, one of the angels of his making rebelled against God. This angel, who sat on the right-hand side of God, was damned to fall with negative matter. It is said many angels sided with this rebel, who also tempted Adam and Eve into exile from paradise. In the digital world of fallen matter, some things appear to change while others do not. Things change at varied paces, and all will change with greater rapidity until everything is utter chaos. This is the key of Atlantean masonry. May you remember it to the grave. This is the grip of Nyarlahotep. Instruction. The lights in the vault suddenly all begin strobing at varied irregular rates. The great, shadowy beast rushes up to the candidate with its tentacles reaching out to grab them. Suddenly, a large yellow light representing the sun breaks across the black horizon in the direction of the candidate's head. The shadowy chaos beast lets out a blood-curdling wail and disappears in a sudden explosion of foul-smelling smoke. From the direction of the candidate's head, a figure approaches, silhouetted in front of the rising sun. He is the source of the voiceover. voiceover. If Nyarlahotep grips your hand, you will surely be a corpse, for to feel his grip is to touch the timeless nothingness. Nyarlahotep was once a black magician. He chose to fall into the temptations of the rebel angel. He turned away from the one true god and made blood sacrifice to the damned pantheons. He fell into an ecstasy, and he entered the realm of the underworld. In this state, Nyarlahotep discovered a terrifying secret. He learned the desert lands west of the Nile were lush and fertile once. It was reduced to silt by the world flood. In the deepest dunes of this desert now rest the corpses of drowned Atlanteans. Then Nyarlahotep was shown the way to raise the dead from the desert. When he returned from the netherworld, the infinite zero of the nothingness, he immediately repented and went to live in the desert. It is said by Bedouins they have seen him squatting in the desert eating dust. The pact Nyarlahotep made with the Dark Lord rendered him a chaos beast, ghost monster of nightmares. It is to Nyarlahotep that I, Imhotep, vizier of the three kings, Cheops, Kephren, and Menkare, 
go to make a pact with him to give my soul to travel the underworld in place of his own in exchange for him raising a courier's guild of dead slaves from the desert all to be stamped with the sole goal of building three great tombs it is I Imhotep who now awakens to dawn in the dune sea from dreaming slumbers of nothingness haunted by Nyarlathotep he is near instruction from the direction of the candidates feet a hooded figure approaches in the brighter light of later dawn the candidate can better see the hooded Nyarlathotep he is all swaddled in rags so that his body and limbs are entirely concealed the gauze wrapped around his skin is seeping blood Nyarlathotep limps up from the direction behind the candidate's head Imhotep draws into view as well Nyarlathotep stands at the candidate's feet and Imhotep stands at the candidate's head Imhotep O oh, wise Nyarlathotep, I know that you can read my thoughts. I understand you know my intentions already. Nyarlathotep, understand my wisdom. O oh, wise Nyarlathotep, I call you now to labor, and by doing so, to serve the one true God. Nyarlathotep, O oh, foolish Imhotep, what future do you imagine you foresee? Where shall our names be carved on the tombs for others we are to build? Who shall remember the workers once the work is done? Will you guide them back to heaven once you have been sent to hell? Imhotep I am called the scribe. Let me pass once through the underworld now, and then return to oversee building on the tombs. I will record all that I observe beyond death, and leave it to my son, Tahotep. He will thus instruct the workers. Nyarlathotep I am called the Chaos Beast and dweller on the threshold. Do you think you can stand my awful judgment for me under the scrutiny of the Most High's all-seeing eye itself until the mortal ends of evil and the final judgment of the material reality? For to answer the call of Cthulhu you must now. To the twin-headed Satan and Moloch you must pledge to be forever indebted. You must become the chaos beast that I, Nyarlathotep, now am. Imhotep O oh, mighty master of your own fate, my destiny is in the hands of the righteous Most High as much now as forever. I will bear your burden but I am judged only by the one true God. That is my right. Nyarlathotep Then you are duly and truly prepared? Imhotep I am. Now, Nyarlathotep, grip my hand to bind our pact. Instruction Imhotep reaches out to Nyarlathotep, but Nyarlathotep extends a bandaged appendage to the candidate. Nyarlathotep to candidate. Know my grip as you shall know a man by his deeds. Instruction. Nyarlathotep seizes the candidate and drags them to their feet. As soon as the candidate is standing, Nyarlathotep vanishes through a concealed trap door, leaving only his outermost robes behind. Imhotep steps up to these and parts them with his foot to reveal a bloody knot of tentacles 
surrounding a single, milky eye. Then Imhotep turns to the candidate and grabs their hand in his. Imhotep to candidate. No more is Nyarlahotep the Chaos Beast. Now I summon Osiris, his immortal soul, into this raised corpse. For your soul's name to live forever, I shall write the book of coming forth into day, and the book of what is in the Amduat, the way of the dead, the river Styx. Though all the many dead you shall raise shall each be branded by your own unique soul, Osiris, sigil of your aura, they will all die only one death, your own, and then you shall be called the king of the underworld and lord of the dead. The slaves in my seed shall follow in our names the same way through the afterlife and we shall become known as great gods, even alike yad heh and Elohim. They will always remember Thoth, soul of Imhotep, and Osiris, soul of Nyarlahotep. Now is the dawn arisen on this first day of the resurrected dead. Let the righteous Most High judge our deeds on this day without error, and may his good mercy Mark our names down for all times as his servants. You shall go forth to raise more dead now, but I must journey now into the timeless nothingness of the underworld. Go now, Lord Osiris, soul of Nyarlahotep. Reach into the desert sands as God reached into the nothingness and raise the dead by calling the bodies of the dead Anunnaki to return to the labor of Atlantean masonry. You shall earn the restoration of your soul and redeem this body which belonged to Satan himself. You shall give these all your soul, and my son, Tahotep, will elevate them to democracy. You go to restore Atlantis now, and I, Imhotep, shall journey through the underworld. When I return, Tahotep shall show you my ways, and then you shall lead the workers through transcendence into paradise. For now we part ways, Osiris resurrected Lord of the dead. Our destinies are already set in stone in the highest heavens above, behind the skies. Go. Instruction. While Imhotep has been speaking, the candidate's initial initiator, the guide, has been sneaking up on the candidate from behind. As Imhotep finishes speaking and turns his back to them, the guide takes the candidate's arm and, turning them around abruptly, escorts them arm in arm from the vault. Guide. So you see that it is because of Imhotep's pact with Nyarlahotep that workers were raised to restore Atlantean masonry after the flood. This is symbolic of how each of us now must work to restore our own fallen souls. We therefore turn to studying the Tree of Life, which is like a blueprint of our finished work. Our DNA is the gross matter of our work and the alignment of the chakras, the tool we use to work upon our DNA. By perfecting our work in this way, we cleanse our aura and our soul transcends. Therefore, we call the art of perfecting our craft, raising the dead. This refers to the transformation of our exterior environment by aligning the chakras to cause our DNA to obey the will of our brains. When our chakras align through the study of the tree of life, our external environment will be calm and serene, a still reflection of our internal composure, 
our DNA doing the will of our brain through its control of our nervous system. This is how our spirits, when called to labor, do good work to cleanse the chi karma in our aura. We raise the dead, nerves usually unused in our brains, to activate our junk DNA. This causes the DNA to transmit the will of the mind directly into the clephotic quanta of our surrounding environment. When we accomplish this, we transcend the lower material world and perceive a higher spiritual world beyond. Instruction. By now, the guide escorts the candidate to the door of the vault and outside into the antechamber. Here they ask the candidate if they have any questions and if they fully understand. If they understand, they are considered past and have graduated from labor. Tahotep's Double Cross Introduction As in the first and second A degree rituals, we begin in an antechamber outside the vault. An initiator or guide of no lower than this 2B degree in attainment themselves explains the knowledge lecture and the history, characters, and plot of the rite. Once the candidate confirms to the guide they understand this instruction, they enter the vault. Guy. While Imhotep passed through the underworld, along the Milky Way, Tahotep, his son, was left as his appointed head of the Overseer's Order. While the couriers labored by day, the Overseers conserved their energy. But then, by night, the Overseers instructed the couriers in the higher arts of democracy, masonry, tarot, and the calendar, and all sorts of splendid wonders. They began to raise the pyramids by constructing an enormous enclosure around the entire base layer and filling it with water to float the blocks into place with a giant boat. All looked forward to Imhotep's return, but Tahotep did not overwork the workers. Tahotep was the wisest of all the overseers and beloved by the clay people. He instructed them in all of his father Imhotep's metaphysics, and they all became as learned as he in time. Nyarlahotep served as Tahotep's own vizier, and if Tahotep but lifted a finger on his right hand, Nyarlahotep would wave the thousands of workers to all move his one to the right, and if Tahotep lifted a finger on his left hand, Nyarlahotep would command the thousands of workers to all move in one wave to the left. Yet Tahotep was not full of pride, and served not as king, but only as court magician to the three great kings of our craft, Cheops, Kefir, and Menkare. The legions of undead all answered to the heart of Nyarlahotep, who offered it then to Tahotep, though only until the return of Imhotep, the coming time of which no one knew but Nyarlahotep. This ritual is about the times when Nyarlahotep showed Tahotep the catacombs beneath Giza, when Nyarlahotep told Tahotep that Imhotep was never coming back, and that he, Nyarlahotep, was Tahotep's true father. The ritual continues when Imhotep returns as a chaos beast, judges Nyarlahotep a traitor, 
and switches bodies with him, thus sending Nyarlathotep in the form of the Chaos Beast back into the Netherworld. The meaning of this ritual is to teach the Atlantean Mason the mechanism of transcending the mundane cares of material reality. Instruction If the candidate gives the word to affirm they understand, the guide ushers the candidate into the darkened vault and closes the door after them. In the middle of the darkened vault, the candidate sees an arcing domed grotto, roofed with crystals, above an underground lake. On a sandbar near the closest shore, beneath the peak of the catacombs dome, arise two very tall, men here stone blocks, ancient with weather. The one on the left of a dark, metallic hue, the one on the right of a brighter, marble hue. The candidate will come to see there is strange, indecipherable, and ever-shifting information being projected as patterns within the crystalline veins of the two massive, upright towers. These flash like slow lightning within the twin stones, and this light alone illuminates the cavern. From the shadows behind the candidate's back, hiding behind the door of the vault as the candidate had entered, Nyarlathotep speaks. As he speaks, he places his grip on the candidate's right shoulder and then steps up beside them into the light. He is dressed as a vagabond mummy still, with blood staining the hieroglyphic inscriptions carefully painted onto his gauze wrappings. Nyarlathotep These are the pillars buried by Enoch in the city east of Eden in Atlantis, before the Flood. Imhotep had them transported here. He discovered them by the Stone of Ram, the Keystone of Noah, that he found and deciphered just outside of Ur, in southern Babylon. As he journeyed northwest, to pass by Sinai into Egypt. Ram, the tablet of testimony, was the key to all languages once. Its geometric shape is timeless, and the markings upon it, the inscriptions of seven of the ten archangels, the pre-diluvial Atlantean king's list, I tell you the splendor of Ram shall be known to all on Judgment Day, and is yet taught to all who seek to know it. It is a testament to the seven sinister angels who rebelled and who were cast down into this material universe. I, Nyarlathotep, am wise of the dawn of time, as was Imhotep before he died. Those who follow the Ram Stone now seeking to find these twins still eight, will get lost and fall into confusion. For now Enoch's tomb is empty, and these twin stele are here, buried beneath the three kings' tombs. Instruction Nyarlathotep guides the candidate by their shoulder and begins leading them down a slight slope towards the crystally radiated stone main hairs. One dark, one light. They step to the water's edge. The closer Nyarlathotep draws towards the twin megaliths, the more he stoops down and assumes a more lizard-like posture and visage. He urges the candidate toward the two obelisks, and they begin wading out ankle-deep in the shallow waters of the lake's shore. Nyarlathotep. I suppose you'd like me to tell you what they say. They are written in Atlantean and contain all the secrets of the universe. It is these each of my corpses seeks to replicate by quarrying the Ashlars 
to build the tomb for the three great kings who we call the three fools for this project is damned folly without these stones being here without them the resurrected dead would not obey me just as they are bound to my heart my heart is bound to these two steely the kings know nothing of these catacombs nor of this lake nor of these stelae. This secret is known to myself and Imhotep, and now you also, but to us alone. We three are Thoth, Osiris, and Horus. Do you not see Tahotep? Just as Imhotep gave his soul for mine, did he become like Thoth, God over time? for he dwells now beyond all time. And just as Imhotep assumed the god form of Thoth, so too did I assume the god form of Osiris. Now, let me tell you how the heavens have already recorded and dictate our destinies. Imhotep is Thoth. I am Osiris. And you are Horus, Tahotep. To raise Osiris, Thoth gave his own life, you see, and so Imhotep shall never return from the underworld. He sacrificed himself and has given you, his son, over to me. Now I am the Great Works Architect, for I assure you, Imhotep is no more. Instruction. The two stones loom over them on a sandbar. Nyarlahotep climbs up the slight embankment. His face appears to be that of a supernaturally large serpent. He stands beside the bright one and reaches out to touch it. As his fingers contact the stone's cold surface, a jolt of lightning bursts through them both, causing a Jacob's Ladder to arise between them. From within this, the chaos beast of Nyarlahotep's true form appears. Voice over. Booming. It is I, Nyarlahotep. It is I, Tahotep. It is I, Imhotep, returned from beyond the grave, in the realms of nothingness, beyond even the underworld. I have come back from beyond the abyss that outstretches the deepest nether realms. Bow now, my son. Bow before your father who has conquered an eternity. Bow now, you traitor, for either way this chaos beast's form is once more your fate for your treachery against me. Instruction. The Chaos Beast's image in the Jacob's Ladders, arcing sparks quavers like the reflection of the moon on a rippling pond. Suddenly the reptilian arisen corpse of the mummified Nyarlahotep is possessed by the soul of Imhotep, and the Chaos Beast's infernal form possessed once more by Nyarlahotep. Imhotep, portrayed by the actor, previously portraying Nyarlahotep. Let it all come down. My revelation shall outlast it all, for I have been to the world beyond Bariah, and I have surveyed the new Jerusalem. Its twelve gates are the twelve houses of the Amduat. Its seven-sided church I have beheld inside and out, and it is like the seven Bay of Ra between the Ka and the Ak. Instruction. The Chaos Beast looms through the electricity screen. It is a puppet armature of tentacles centered around a corpuscle eye, red with rage and streaming tears. Its pupil is a mouth and its iris a row of hooked fangs. Nyarlahotep, 
booming. Tahotep, you may escape, but Imhotep, you shall not. I shall pursue you until the final Sabbath and see your clay corpse buried beyond the wasteland's outskirts on the edge of nothingness. Your home for eternity shall be to guard the west bank of the river Styx. Your destiny will be to wander eternally alone, licking sand to search for salty silt. You will yet suffer my fate for me. I will never die. I will get you. Instruction. Imhotep urges the candidate away, toward the shoreline and the door of the vault, away from the twin pillars and the chaos beast near Lahotep. Imhotep, turning to Nyarlahotep. Nyarlahotep, O oh terrifying, feverish insanity, you cannot harm me because I am one loyal to God who sent me. I have cast you already into the emptiness of the abyss once by my word. I shall not say it again except by action. Come at me and your will will wilt, O oh chaos beast. You shall forever lose what little light of hope you have left. Forsake. Now. Nyarlahotep. You are unwise to be unjust to me, your servant, O vizier. For I have sat upon the seat to which you would now ascend. The corpses are all of me. All mine alone to command. I was bound only to this portal until you returned my true form to me. Now I cross the threshold once and forever to dwell in the land of the living and leave behind the world of the dead with you in it. Imhotep Nyarlahotep, you, whose one eye hungers for justice, must repent now your lust for the powers of this world. I warn you, they are only an illusion, and I can turn them against you. Nyarlahotep. It is too late for you now. I summon Marduk, king of demons. I summon Cthulhu, of chaos and formlessness. I summon Satan and Moloch, the twin-headed devil. I summon the host of all Hades to spread your plague upon this realm, the material universe. Fly free, all you damned gargoyles. I unchain thee in Imhotep's name. Instruction. As the puppeteered armature of tentacles undulates, the whole of the chaos beast's pupil mouth dilates to engorge the sclera. Through his eye, Nyarlahotep vomits himself inside out. Black smoke bellows out of the emptied out Nyarlahotep whose tentacles now take root around the twin main hairs as he stretches himself open across the gateway to the underworld. His remaining flesh gapes agog and tears through to reveal a portal to the inferno of hell. Imhotep to Candidate Tahotep, my son, go to call all the undead to return as warriors behind you. I, in Nyarlahotep's clay body, must enter the gateway of Nyarlahotep and battle him upon the threshold before he can widen the rift in the veil. Turning again to Nyarlahotep. You cannot cast curses before a man sent to you by God. If you will not approach me and be laid waste by my righteousness here, then I shall take my word to you now. Instruction As Imhotep approaches Nyarlahotep, the initiator, or guide, who prepared the candidate and who is snuck up behind them, now takes the candidate arm in arm and escorts them towards and out the vault door and into the antechamber, discussing with the candidate as they walk the meaning of this degree's ritual. Guide 
So you see how we transcend the mortal world while still alive. We must delve deep into our minds inside our quantum thoughts that guide our nerves to control our DNA. We must conquer the urge to destroy and do evil there, deep within each of us. Know that only you can do this for yourself, but that you are not alone in doing it. Truly, there are a legion of us who are seeking to transcend the mortal world while still alive. We all work together in this great karma yoga. The battle between order and chaos is within each of us. We must therefore live life rightly as a warrior for increased perception, increased awareness, and expansion of consciousness, both our own others, and that of the entire cosmos. The true Overseer's order is open to any who have become inverted from the mundane, and it is thus comprised only of those who have graduated from labor by working to perfect themselves. Because we have transcended cares for the material world, we are able to look down upon it from above, but only if we work to perfect ourselves do we preserve our place on the planes above. We can each do good alone. When we all work together, we can do even better. Therefore, seek out and surround those who do good alone, and, in invisible silence, encourage their good deeds. When they are ready to, they will learn how to assist others and to command their reality by communing with their inner will and confronting the conflict between good and evil. In the deepest realms of the seeker's mind, they find this inverting dualism, for it is the binary language of our quantum thoughts themselves. We input binary logic and output creative uncertainty, and that is how our mind makes itself manifest around us in our material world. Each of us is like the bright singularity at the umbilical navel between a parent black hole and a baby universe. The fabric of the space-time continuum itself softens, melts, and molds itself to the touch of the mind. But only those of us who knowingly and rightly do good deeds and thus perfect their karma know how to sustain and to control our mental grasp on our own realities. We understand the multiverse surrounds the outside of the womb of our perception. We understand how to manifest rightly because we have chosen to conquer the dualism of good and evil by asserting our innermost will over the most fundamental quantum uncertainty. If you do not understand, you will have plenty of time for asking questions. For now you are considered a true self-overseer. Welcome to the Overseer's Order. The Optical Illusion of Imhotep. Instruction. Before being led into the vault where the initiation ritual will occur, the candidate is first prepared in the antechamber by an initiator of no less rank than this 2C degree who explains to the candidate the background history behind, the characters involved in, and the events portrayed by the 2C degree initiation ritual. Thus, Guide In the contributor's degree we learned about the dream that Cheops, Kefren, and Menkare had about heaven. In the 2A degree of the symbolic series, we learn how Imhotep, the Three Kings Vizier, commissioned Nyarlahotep 
to conscript workers to build the monumental tombs envisioned by the three kings. In the 2B degree that followed, we saw how Nyarlahotep attempted to betray and murder Imhotep. Although these events have, thus far, been presented as true, we understand they are not necessarily factually accurate. In this 2C degree, we will learn what parts of this story are not factually accurate. But we must remember that what we have learned, though historically fictional, is only symbolic of a greater truth. Truth is infinitely greater than fact and fiction combined. And, just so, is the one true God greater than all creation. Although we can use geometry as a tool to accurately represent measurements greater than even the entire known universe, we must realize knowledge of such does not raise us up to be equal with God. By such knowledge, added to such humility, we grow wise with understanding, and so may do God's work thus earning his just rewards. These rewards themselves are known only to God and are not ours unless given to us by him. Thus we will now learn how Imhotep discovered the truth of God greater than all the falsehoods and facts of his creation. Instruction The guide asks the candidate if they understand and, if the candidate confirms they do, then the guide escorts the candidate to and through the door of the vault. Once inside the vault, the guide closes the door behind them and leaves the candidate alone in the pitch darkness. After a moment has passed, a deep booming voice speaks, representing Metatron, the voice of God. Voice over. Metatron. You have failed me, Imhotep. To serve the desire for immortality in history, did you commit necromancy for three heathen kings? You may have believed I would judge your deed only by its results and not as the deed itself. Your motives may be just, but if you do wrong to accomplish what is right, you serve neither wrong nor right, because to do right you can do no wrong than by doing wrong for the right reasons. You only plant poison seed. Communication between the living and the dead is indeed possible, even bringing a dead body back to life. But by doing so, we are removing their souls from the path of evolution towards heaven. You did not know that your corpse workers needed their own souls. You sought to make them all alike, using only a single soul, thus making the one an archetype above the others. But all things alive are individual and unique by nature. By giving the couriers oversight and teaching them what is right, you have drawn out a unique soul in each, and these, being not born but brought to life artificially, had to come from souls already evolved past death, who volunteered to return to life. What you cannot foresee is how these superior souls, tainted by their dead flesh, will eventually turn against you. History, therefore, shall remember their deed as immortal, but they themselves must be destroyed utterly.
Therefore, you will only be remembered to the degree you accomplish that, because your deed can only be justified by their liberation. You must undo your deed of evil by freeing the ones who accomplish good on your behalf. If flesh is their prison, or if it is Egypt's underworld, you and your seed shall lead them to liberation until the final day, and that is my commandment to you. Imhotep, this is what you must do for your workers. You must mummify their corpses and then wait for them to desiccate, each buried beneath a pyramid underground. Your offspring shall then dig up the mummified workers and burn their bodies into ash. The ash must be mixed with water. The offspring of your offspring must then make 72 clay pots out of these ashes of the workers and bury them beneath the surface of the Dead Sea. Inside these clay pots will dwell the workers' souls. Your offsprings, offsprings, offspring, must then dig these up, for inside them will be found writings, directions on what next to do with these souls. I will tell you that, by their right interpretation, the heavens will be opened up before all, and all creation will be revealed. More than this, I cannot tell you, Imhotep, because of your servitude to these three heathen kings. Though your heart was right, your deed was wrong. Now, the Great Pyramids will be forever falsely remembered as tombs until Judgment Day. For only by freeing the workers' souls from their bodies utterly will your offspring open the gates of heaven before the eyes of all. These souls are my self-selected fallen angels but they shall be the redemption of all mankind. They will teach everyone what you have taught them, and so the curse of humanity, Kabbalah, will have survived the flood and destruction of Enoch's Atlantis. Because of your deed, the temptation of Adam by Raziel will continue to be manifest as ignorant blindness among some and true insight among only the few until Judgment Day. Only then will I send my own Son, Christ, to welcome all humanity back into Paradise who turn away from all falsehoods and temptations to ignore the lessons of their history. It was for the seven Archon's powers that the twelve Archons fell, and so the Flood destroyed Atlantis. But I tell you, the twelve Archons only fell to the powers of seven because of you, Imhotep, for you practiced necromancy to raise the powers of the seven Archons to anoint the dead with one new soul. By raising the dead, you reincarnated souls. When these souls are finally freed on Judgment Day, then the temptation of Adam by Raziel will finally be forgiven of everyone living and dead. Understand now, Imhotep, that only then will they all be forgiven, and until then, 
all existence, my entire creation, will remain the purgatory of all souls. Imhotep, the mind, is the soul. Imhotep, wake up. Imhotep, arise. Instruction. Suddenly a rift opens in front of the candidate, whose eyes have by now grown accustomed to the dark. At first, a blinding light shines through. As the candidate's eyes begin to adapt, they can make out that the rift is the Jacob's Ladder of Electricity arising between the twin stele from the preceding 2B degrees ritual ceremony. On the far side of the rift appears Tahotep, standing just behind Nyarlahotep, who appears like a mummified reptilian humanoid. Suddenly, from behind the candidate comes the voice of the guide, who snuck in behind them when the candidate first entered the vault. Voice over. Guide one. It is I, Nyarlahotep. It is I, Tahotep. It is I, Imhotep, returned from beyond the grave, in the realms of nothingness, beyond even the underworld. I have come back from beyond the abyss that outstretches the deepest nether realms. Bow now, my son. Bow before your father who was conquered in eternity. Bow now, you traitor, for either way this chaos beast's form is once more your fate for your treachery against me. Instruction. The guide then grips the candidate on the shoulder, surprising them as much as possible, and quickly turns the candidate around away from the spectacle on the rift and escorts them hurriedly out of the vault and into the antechamber. Guide. So you see now how the ancient saying about looking long into the abyss, that it looks long into us, has a double meaning for we initiates of the third degree. To clone a body is to summon a soul, and to resurrect the dead is to reincarnate souls. In the East this was believed perpetual, and in the West associated with Judgment Day. But we who have learned of Atlantis, the civilization before the world flood, know that this only occurs if one raised the dead and we understand this to refer to the activation of junk DNA by using usually unused neurons. When we delve as deeply as possible into our own composition, we discover our ubiquity with the entire universe on the most fundamental levels. Thus, by altering our internal composition, we project change outwards that can have a direct effect on our surrounding environment. Eventually, we discover that each of us exists inside our own unique universe in a multiverse, and that the greater a universe seems within to be expanding, the more it is evaporating into the nulliverse that consumes the forms and light of the multiverse. <laughs>